describe. She's traveled extensively around the world. When she came back after that trip to the US, she started uh, exploring urban environments. She was very concerned about the cities and towns and how they've been drastically reduced habitat for wildlife. And that drew her to the University of Delaware to work with Doug Talame, who is the author of Bringing Nature Home and recently published another book, Nature's Best Hope, uh, to learn more about the urban environments. And so she, she's, uh, she is going tonight to share some of her latest research. Please welcome me. Um, join me in welcoming Desiree. much. Thank you for that introduction and thank you everyone for being here. It was really full in this nice room. Uh, so I'm really excited to get the chance to um, tell you a little bit about my research and to share with you a little bit about what the uh, birds and bees have taught me about uh, how to garden in our yard to uh, support habitat. And I'm also going to touch really on how you as a householder can participate in personal conservation action through the way that you cultivate uh, your yard. So, um, but before I get started, I just want to introduce myself again, just so you know a little bit about who I am as a scientist. Uh, so I like to call myself an interaction ecologist. And the reason for that is that I study interactions between plants and animals. I study how they interact with their environments. And I also study how they interact with people who are the primary drivers of ecological change. I uh, focus mostly on songbirds and the insects that they eat. Um, and most of my work takes place in human-dominated landscapes, like residential yards, urban forests, and I also dabble a little bit in agriculture as well. And increasingly, more and more of my research uh, people are just a part of the equation, it's inherent. And so I'm actually doing some collaborations now with social scientists to understand why people are making the decisions that they do in their yards in the first place. And so these human-dominated landscapes um, are basically everywhere. We have completely dramatically transformed the world to support a growing human population. And with that comes really cascading impacts on habitat quality for <coughs> But we're also facing dramatic losses of biodiversity around the globe and across different organisms. And we're facing an extinction of nature experiences in every generation. And so our grand challenge as conservationists, as the global public, is to really understand how can we share these places that we live, work, and play with biodiversity while simultaneously supporting people as well. And I would argue that we can't make progress without your help. We have to include privately managed land. In the United States, uh, more than 60% of it is considered privately owned. And there's some estimates for the lower uh, 48, but 10 to 15 percent of that is residential areas alone. And actually, the Audubon Society also estimated that in the last few decades, we've lost over 150 million acres of habitat for wildlife due to the effects of urbanization. Um, but I'm actually an optimist. I would say that we haven't lost that habitat. We've actually just transformed it. And when you look at urban and suburban areas, you actually see a lot of different kinds of green space. Um, but this is a challenge because the management of these spaces is by people making choices based on their own needs and values. And so in order for us to really improve these areas for biodiversity, uh, scientists like myself need to offer you information on how to actually do that. As land managers, you're making tons of different decisions on your properties. Um, what trees that you cut down, which ones that you plant in its place, the lawns that you mow and the designer gardens that you create. Each one of those seemingly small decisions that you make in your yard has the additive effect of completely transforming quality of habitat for wildlife. But in urban areas, we do see conservation success stories. So 
So I want to share a couple of them with you now. So in New York City, just in the last like five years or so, we found a new species of leopard frog right there in downtown Manhattan using people's properties and it was right under our noses. How cool was that? In Minnesota, we have our only uh, endangered species of insect, insect, the rusty patched bumblebee. And we know that some of the last stakeholders of the rusty patch bumblebee population is using people's yards in Minneapolis, St. Paul. In fact, we wanted to collect data on these in Minneapolis. We couldn't do that because of this endangered bumblebee. In, uh, down in Florida, we have some of our most threatened species of orchids. And conservationists are starting to work with homeowners to start doing some uh, transplants of these, in, of these threatened orchids into urban areas and we're seeing that these flowers are really thriving in these areas. And then one of my favorite stories is this Italian butterfly, which is a butterfly that we thought was completely extinct. We thought it was totally gone. And then what happened was that the plant that this butterfly relies on to complete its life cycle got really popular in horticulture. And people just started planting it everywhere. And then lo and behold, all of a sudden, the butterfly popped up again because it was just waiting for habitat to be created. And once that plant was there, this beautiful, amazing butterfly was able to come back. I may be biased, but it seems to me like there's a lot of interest in creating pollinator habitat, which is really really exciting. Everywhere we go, we're seeing more people that are starting to get interested and excited about, you know, creating habitat in their yard, um, in the places that they live and they work. And we see lots of great signs that are saying we're creating pollinator habitat, we're getting certified wildlife habitat, and this is fantastic. But again, the point that I want to make up, that I hope that I uh, share with you today, is that we really need to have better information to help us do that. And so I hope that you'll get some of that information here tonight. But before I share with you some of my pieces of advice, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. <laughs> um, I'm an entomologist, so I really like insects. So I'm going to show you a lot of great pictures now. So think in your head, what is a pollinator? You don't have to shout it out, but just like get a picture in your head of some animal that is a pollinator to you, okay? So what a pollinator really is, is any kind of animal that transmits pollen from one indi individual plant to another. So many of you, when you're thinking of, about a pollinator, you might be thinking of something like this, like our beautiful, amazing butterflies, which are fantastic and gorgeous and charismatic and we see them on our flowers and it's real fun. I study butterflies and uh, you know, I just love them. I never get tired of looking at butterflies and they have tremendous, amazing diversity. But butterflies are really just charismatic, gaudy, day flying moths. <laughs> <laughs> make up most of the diversity uh, of the doctor out there. Um, and actually, our moths are really incredibly important pollinators. It's just that most of the pollination is happening at night when we're all asleep, although some of them do uh, come out during the day sometimes. <coughs> Another pollinator that you might be thinking of are the bees, right? Bees are just great, efficient pollinators, and they're pollinating the majority of our flowering plants, our trees, and our crops. Our agriculture depends on pollination by our bees. But when people think about bees, a lot of times they think about just one bee, this honeybee, which is actually the equivalent of thinking about a cow if somebody asks you about a mammal or a chicken when somebody asks you about a bird, because the honeybee is a domesticated non-native insect. We actually have 4,000 different species of bees in the United States, of native bees, and these native bees are also incredibly important for our pollination and provide lots of ecosystem services. 
The pollinators that people don't tend to think about are some of the other really fun insects that are beautiful and amazing and diverse in their own way. Like beetles, they can be incredibly important pollinators. Our flies, our flower flies, they, they will visit and transmit pollen and are just incredibly diverse and wonderful. And also our wasps, and actually the majority of the wasps are non-aggressive and non-stinging, but can also provide this great ecosystem service. And then I can't, I can't just focus on insects, I've got to show this little dude right here. I love hummingbirds, <laughs> and they are also an incredibly important pollinator as well. If you're a savvy person, a plant enthusiast, you might have noticed that the background of a lot of these photos that I shared looked very similar. Yeah. And the reason for that is because these were all photos that I took in one day on one plant in my backyard. Wow. <laughs> this is a hummingbird thing, in case you're curious. Um, so it really just goes to show all the different amazing biodiversity that you can support just by planting one individual plant in your yard. What was that plant? <laughs> hummingbird mint. <laughs> yes, the hummingbird mint. I think the genus is, I'm going to say it wrong, is it Gastichet or something? Oh, that is that's that's the bottom, <laughs> bottom row, middle picture. Can you tell me what that is? Right here? Yes. This one? Yes. This is a uh, surfeit fly. It's a type of flower fly. I don't know the genus off the top of my head, but I could look it up for you. So, which brings me to the overarching question that I'm discussing with you here today is really, and this is the central theme of my research program, can we strategically manage gardens in ways that benefit pollinator habitat in these human-dominated landscapes? And today I'm going to present to you three action items that you can take home with you. One is native plant selection. The second is I want you to embrace a lazy gardener approach. <coughs> And finally, I want you to be wildlife friendly within the yard, but also beyond the yard as well. And so I'm going to share with you today some pieces of evidence that come from my research program and that of colleagues to support these three action items. So first, I'm going to talk about native plant selection. And this is a, a large portion of my research um, and a lot of what I did for my dissertation work with Doug Talley and some current work I'm doing now. So, if you're making a choice of what sort of plants to have in your garden, you might be asking yourself, should I plant a native species or a non-native species? Uh, this is not a trivial question. Horticulture is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, Non-native plants are extremely common in urban and suburban areas, and they're much easier to find in our plant nurseries. And although traditionally most choices of plants were made based on how pretty a plant is or how easy it is to maintain, increasingly more and more people are interested in also providing plants that have ecological function. And all of you here tonight is, is evidence of that. Um, but we really need to ask the question of whether these non-native plants that we include in our gardens are the ecological equivalent of native species. <clears throat> I want to first provide you a little bit of evidence for why plant identity and plant origin would matter for our insects. And how many here know what the monarch butterfly eats as a caterpillar? Anybody? Anyone want to shout it out? No, 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 yeah, we all learned that. Uh, you know, in, in like elementary school, we learn about milkweed. It's this wonderful, amazing example of host plant specialization. But turns out, and I did not know this until I started working with Doug, is that the the monarch is not the exception; it's the rule. And 90% of our plant eating insects are specialists to some degree. So our caterpillars that grow up to be butterflies and moths all are depending on particular host plants to complete that life cycle. And the reason for that is that these species have adapted over evolutionary time to feed on particular plants for which they've overcome those defensive chemical compounds that are found in the leaf, and they also adapt in other ways such as biomorphology or the timing of that plant as well. 
And so this double tooth prominent is a really great example of a species that feeds exclusively on elm trees, um, but it also blends in really nicely with that double tooth elm leaf as well. And so I'm going to share with you a few examples of specialization just to give you an idea of what's out there. And so entomologists are really convenient. They like to name common names of species based on what plant they use. Uh, so here we have this green butterfly, the juniper hair streak. Guess what it eats? <laughs> juniper. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> if you want to have the juniper hair streak, you need to plant a plant from the genus Juniperus. And one native example here is the red cedar. Here's another example. This is actually, it's very beautiful and gaudy, but this is actually a moth, the rosy maple moth. Um, I get this all the time at my light up here in Massachusetts. And this moth feeds exclusively on trees from the Acer genus, maples. And so you might think like, oh, well, there's lots of maples out there. So there's lots of plants for this moth. And, and you're right, maples are pretty common, but they actually, even though they can use any species of maple, the females really like to lay their eggs on sugar maple most of all. And so in order to get the rosy maple moth, you don't need to just plant the maples, you need to really choose the species that they are preferring. Here's one of my favorite moths. Um, this is a uh, snowberry hummingbird moth or a snowberry clearwing. This is a day flying moth that um, is often mistaken to be a hummingbird. And this, uh, this species will use quite a few different plants, snowberry, uh, native bush honeysuckle, uh, uh, lancera, our native vine honeysuckle, <coughs> like coral honeysuckle, and dogbane as well. These are all the plants that this species prioritizes and uses when it's during its caterpillar form. And then when it grows up to become an adult moth, then it uses different plants in order to acquire nectar. So in my experience, if you want to get hummingbird moth, you need to have flocks in your yard. And that is a great way to get those adults coming in. But once you get them coming in for nectar, you also want to provide habitat for the caterpillars as well. Another example um, of specialization is our eastern tiger swallowtail, which you may see around this area. Um, I get them a lot in Shutesbury, where I'm from. Um, they are what's considered a generalist, because they use lots of different plants. And when you look in the host plant literature, you can see they will use all kinds of different things. But what they do is exhibit specialization to a local to a plant in a local area. So um, up here in Massachusetts, our eastern tiger swallowtails love cherry trees. You can, you, you can be pretty sure that you're going to find some of the caterpillars of this species if you look on some cherry trees. But down in Delaware, where I did my dissertation, you'd be hard pressed to find one on a cherry tree. You actually find them more on Liriodendron, the tulip tree. Um, and then if you go even farther south to, say, South Carolina or so, the only tree that they're using down there is Sweet Bay Magnolia. Um, so even though this species should use all these different plants, they really don't. They're specialized to particular plants in local areas as well. <clears throat> and so it really um, comes as no surprise then that if we introduce these non-native plants that caterpillars are not adapted to use, that we wouldn't see the same species um, that are using them. So we have, um, on, in a, a, um, entomologists have found that non-native plants support, tend to support lower herbivore diversity. They tend to support fewer caterpillar species overall and they tend to support fewer specialist species as well. And the reason for that is that these caterpillars just, they're adapted to use host plants that have been replaced by these introduced <coughs> non-native species. <clears throat> so it turns out that there's a lot of caterpillar diversity that's out there. Um, this was actually a little bit of a surprise to me until I started working on the data. So here in Massachusetts, 
We have 2,249 different species of butterflies and moths that are known to be in this state. So I have only shown you a small fraction of the diversity that's out there. Um, but it turns out that when you look at the individual plants and how many caterpillar species they support, there is a lot of variance. Um, this is a, a project that Doug and I are working on right now. Um, and so the, this is data from Massachusetts. So um, your top plants up here are oaks that are supporting 477 different caterpillar species that are using our oak trees. We have cherries at 415. Uh, willows at 406, birches at 397, um, and our herbaceous species, our perennials and annuals, also have some power players too. So goldenrod, 131, asters, 102. Um, these are the species that are supporting most of the caterpillar diversity for Massachusetts. It's just that our woody plants tend to support more um, diversity overall. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a whole slew of native and non-native species that aren't known to support much caterpillar diversity at all. Um, so here are, again, some numbers from Massachusetts. We have lilac at 26. Actually, lilac is pretty good for a non-native species at 26. Uh, ginkgo tree, six. Um, what do we have? Bamboo, one. One species of caterpillar is known to use bamboo. Uh, Zalcoa, Japanese elm, and then we have again in our annuals and perennials, um, Hellbore 5, Daffodil 1, Hosta, Zinnia, Hyacinth, Cosmos, Marigold, everybody sees those at Home Depot, right? All of those aren't known for any caterpillar species at all. <clears throat> it turns out that when you look at the entire United States, the this is, this is the pattern that you see again and again. You see some plants that are disproportionately important for supporting the caterpillar diversity. This is a very simplified, um, simplified version of a national scale analysis of caterpillar diversity on those plants. And we see that there's 15 plants that are the ones that are the power players that are supporting the majority of that caterpillar diversity. <coughs> At the very top here is oaks. And it doesn't matter if you are in Massachusetts, or in California, or Texas, or Michigan, oaks are supporting most of the caterpillar diversity. And then we have things like willows, cherries, pines, poplars, blueberries, all kinds of, um, there's 15 that are the most um, important. So I've talked a lot about caterpillars, but you might be thinking, well, that's just one animal. You know, group of animals out there. What about the other insects? And there are lots of other pollinators that are also plant, plant specialists, like our flower flies that will exhibit particular preferences for certain flowers while they're breeding. Um, our beetles can be specialists in both their adult and their larval form. And then many folks are surprised to learn that our bees can also be pollen specialists, only visiting certain plants and bringing back certain pollen in order to feed their broods. Um, I'm a scientist, so I like data, and I wanted to see just how many that might be. Um, and fortunately, we have that data at USGS um, down in Patuxent, Maryland. And what they found is that more than 30% of our native bees are considered specialists. So for the eastern United States, that's about 120 species. With bees, most of the specialism is one bee to one plant, and we see that over and over again like our Adrena fragilis, the fragile dogwood bee, that only feeds on dogwood. Um, but I wanted to see just how, um, just if there were some plants that um, supported many different bee species, and these are the ones that I found. So willows, a tree. You learned about bees and trees, here you go. This is an important one for bees. Willows are supporting 14 species. Dogwoods at four, hollies at two, rhododendron at four. And then for our perennials and annuals, we have um, sunflowers, goldenrods, all oh, blueberries are woody, but asters, they are supporting 10 to 14 specialist bees apiece. So if you're interested in creating habitat um, for bees, you should really be prioritizing plants that are supporting specialists. Because if you support the specialists, you're going to get the generalists as well. 
like the uh, our, um, common eastern bumblebee or the honeybees, they're all going to come to these same plants as well. <clears throat> What's really interesting about bees is that we're starting to understand that this specialism might be part of the reason that some bees are particularly vulnerable to habitat loss and degradation. And we find that in bumblebees, some bees have really strong pollen preferences, and some of them don't care at all and will use any plant. But it turns out that the ones that have the strongest pollen preferences are also the ones that are in the steepest decline. And we also see that in urban areas, even if we have really high bee diversity in urban and suburban areas, what we don't have in these areas are pollen specialists. We have many of the generalists. And one example of this is, again, this rusty patch bumblebee uh, that is an endangered species. Um, and they um, uh, are trying to promote that people plant the flowers that this particular bee um, needs for reproduction, like, like Minarda, the bee balm. So I'm talking a lot about insects here, um, but some of you might be like, I don't care about insects. <laughs> You know, what about the, the charismatic things like birds? I'm with you, I'm a bird person too. And I'm gonna tell you why plant identity would matter to our birds. And the reason for that is really pretty simple. Birds eat insects, <laughs> surprise! <laughs> insects are incredibly important for supporting our bird populations. Um, and again, I'm a scientist, so I like data. So I wanted to see just how many that might be. <coughs> is in the United States and Canada, about 440 bird species are known to eat insects at least in some point in the annual cycle. And the reason for that is that insects are a power-packed, super nutritious food. And that's really important, especially when you're doing things like breeding and trying to feed growing baby birds in the nest. We also see again and again, like caterpillars, which grow up to be butterflies, tend to be disproportionately preferred by these birds. And the reason is that they have high protein, which is great for growing bones and making feathers. They have high calories, which means they're really efficient uh, power pack of food. And they also have high carotenoids, which is really important for immune function. <clears throat> and so in this way, in, uh, insect conservation or bird conservation is intimately connected to insect conservation. And our insect conservation is really built on a foundational plant community that we create in our yards. But if we're creating a foundational plant community that's composed of non-native plants that aren't supporting those insects, what does that mean for our bird species? And so this brings me to one of the questions that I asked while I was working with Doug Townley at the University of Delaware, I also worked with Pete Maron, who's at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, and we wanted to ask this question of how non-native plants are affecting these food web linkages between plants, insects, and birds. And we did that in a project called Neighborhood Nest Watch, which is a really fun community science program where we actually go into people's yards. We uh, collect data about birds and insects, but we also invite people to join us in our data collection so that they can learn about birds and insects, but also the process of science as well. And uh, this work was funded through uh, an NSF grant, Environmental Biology Grant. For this work, Biology Grant. For this work, I focus primarily on the Carolina chickpea, which is a model perfect insectivorous bird to ask these questions. I found out in the middle of my PhD that the Cherokee Native Americans, whose land we were occupying in Virginia, <laughs> used to call the chickadee the bird of truth and the bringer of good fortune. And so I found it really kind of serendipitous that I ended up using this chickadee as my bird of truth to try to understand how non-native plants were affecting food webs. But they're really a great species to ask this question because they use nest boxes so we can attract them to breed. Um, they're charismatic and amazing, and so it was really easy to get people excited about being a part of this project. 
Um, but most importantly, more than 95% of their diet are insects and arthropods like caterpillars and spiders and leafhoppers. We collected a lot of data for this project, which I'm not going to talk to you about tonight. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you a general sense of what we did. So we went into a yard. So here, this circle here is around our focal yard, which is at the star. We put up a PVC nest box to attract the birds to nest. And we asked those householders to monitor those boxes for breeding activity. And then what was so great is that that freed up more time for me to go out and collect additional data, like catching birds so that we could take measurements. Um, and we also did very careful habitat surveys uh, to identify what is the amount of native and non-native plants that are in that bird's territory, and then what sort of insect biomass we'll be finding on the different trees in the area. Of course, uh, we also had to go around the yard and make sure that if the birds were not nesting in the yard, that they weren't just nesting in the neighbor's yard or in a, in a tree cavity somewhere. And of course, birds um, aren't very uh, cooperative. Sometimes they do really funny things like this, like nest in a newspaper slot. Um, so this bird actually nested in a newspaper slot for three years in a row. <laughs> they were successful every year. Um, here's, here's the nest right here. It's not vertical, it's horizontal. Um, and so it really goes to show that if the food is there, these birds will find a way. This is the part of the talk where I clarify what I mean by native and non-native. Because non-nativeness can depend on the spatial or the temporal scale that you're interested in. So that for the purposes of this study, we considered something to be native if it had a natural distribution that included the eastern United States. So anything that did not include the eastern United States, such as from Japan or Europe or Australia or even the western United States, we considered that non-native. Um, some people may have a uh, stronger or looser definition of native, um, but for the purposes of this study, this is what I mean. Um, we, I'm also going to talk a lot about native plant biomass, and so I want to give you a sense for how we actually calculated that. Um, and so what we did is do very careful surveys where we measured the crown volume the height of the crown and the width and the depth. And we can use um, some equations to calculate what the volume of foliage is. And then use some very careful forestry um, calculations to determine whether um, what is the dominance of native plants and the dominance of non-native plants. Um, that's a very uh, crude overlook of how we did that, but I can speak to you in more detail later if you're interested. And what we found is that when we look at the amount of caterpillar biomass on native and uh, non-native trees, we see much higher found on native trees compared to our non-natives. Um, and so this is really showing that those differences in diversity that entomologists have found, um, where they found fewer species and fewer specialists, this is actually translating into um, a metric that's meaningful for birds, which is the amount of food that is out there. I actually have done um, some more analyses on these data and I actually see that most of the insects are more abundant on native trees. The ones that aren't more abundant, um, or the ones that are more abundant on non-native trees are things like scale insects, aphids, leaf hoppers, a lot of those horticultural pests, which also tend to be non-native, and they were imported in with the host plant when, when that plant was originally introduced. Doug and I did a side study um, also to look at cultivars. So if you go to a plant nursery, you're not going to find a red maple that's similar genetically to the red maple that's found in the forest. <coughs> you're going to find one that's been bred specifically for horticulture. And so what we wanted to do was to see, are these native cultivars supporting insects in the same way as our straight native species? And so we looked at six different traits that are selected for in horticulture. We looked at enhanced fall color, so it's more red in the fall. 
leaf variegation, like the sweet gum, uh, change of growth habit, um, so if it's a dwarf versus a tall tree, uh, enhanced fruiting, like blueberries, um, and also red or purple leaves. And so we compared, um, so for example, uh, for this variegated sweet gum, we compared the straight sweet gum to a variegated version. And what we found is that the only trait that had any negative effect on caterpillar abundance and diversity were red leaf cultivars. So here this is an example of an eastern redbud that has been bred to have lots of red coloring. And it makes sense that these trees wouldn't support the same caterpillar diversity because they um, have these anthocyanins that are in the leaves that deter feeding. But for all the other traits, we didn't see any clear relationships, which suggests some evidence that buying those cultivars at a plant nursery might be okay. But we really do need more research. Unfortunately, we have colleagues that are working on this question right now. <clears throat> the next question was really understand, uh, do chickadees prefer native plants? If these native plants have more food, are they actually finding um, are they actually preferring them? And we basically let the chickadees tell us what they like. So we use this technique called color banding. So we put these, we actually capture the birds, we put plastic color bands on their legs, and then we can identify this bird with our binoculars and know exactly who that individual is. So this is blue yellow, he's my favorite. I knew, I knew that he was paired to a, to a female that had pink. I knew that he was having young and he had six babies, and then I could follow him around the neighborhood and see just what kind of plants that he's choosing. <laughs> and so here's Blue Yellow's territory. At the star here is where the nest is. And you can see a lot of the foraging was happening right there around the nest in that focal yard. And part of that was because the person had planted a black cherry right in their tree. So, oh, do you have a question? What's the neighborhood? Where is oh, it? I'm sorry, this is in Washington, D.C. Oh, thank you for asking that question. Yes, yeah, so most of this work is happening in downtown Washington, D.C. and in the suburban areas of Maryland around as well. Um, and so this homeowner had planted black cherry, which the, the birds were really liking, so they went there a lot. They went to a sweet gum that was planted as a street tree. They uh, went to an airwood viburnum in the neighbor's yard, a Princeton elm, which is a cultivar of elm that's resistant to Dutch elm disease that was found along the street. And they also went over this neighbor who let their yard go and a black walnut came up. <laughs> so you can see that there's a lot of areas of this neighborhood that these birds are really using selective foraging, but there's a lot of areas in this neighborhood that they're avoiding. Uh, so what is it that these birds are avoiding? And the answer is, it's non-native plants. <laughs> and we went back to see just how many species of caterpillar these different plants were supporting, and we found this really nice positive relationship between the number of caterpillar species that a plant supports and how much the birds liked that plant as well. So here for native plants, you see this strong linear relationship which is the kind of relationship that scientists just kind of dream about. <laughs> um, so they highly prefer our, um, uh, our trees that are supporting the most caterpillars. We see that preferences are lower for non-native plants, um, and that relationship is also much weaker, suggesting that these plants are not reliable for finding food and are really just kind of functioning as pretty things in the landscape and not um, supporting habitat. Um, you may be wondering right now, well, what sort of non-native plants is supporting over 500 different species of caterpillar? And the answer to that is congeneric species. So things like native maples are, or red maples are our native uh, maple, and then we have Norway maple, which is a non-native version that's very closely related to red maple, but it's from, it's introduced to our region. So here, most of our non-native, um, unrelated plant taxa are almost completely avoided. The, the birds just don't prefer them at all. We see that our related species, like Norway maple, Japanese cherry, those ones are preferred a little bit more, but they're not the ecological equivalent of the native species. So if you really want to support habitat for birds, you need to prioritize the straight native species. 
So while we were um, following these chickadees around, it was also spring migration. Uh, the chickadees in Washington, D.C. are breeding from, uh, from the first week of April to the first week of June. And so we're following these birds around these oak trees, and at the same time, these trees are dripping with colorful warblers and tanagers and orioles and all kinds of amazing um, creatures. In fact, during the four years that I did this study, we documented over 50 different species of migratory birds and over 20 species of warbler that are using residential yards. And when I tell this to ornithologists, their mind is blown. They're always just so incredibly surprised that we would see this kind of diversity. But these are birds that don't breed in yards at all. They breed in the boreal forests of Canada, and every year they make transcontinental flights of, um, ton of thousands of miles into Central and South America in order to track food resources. And so, but during the way, they're stopping over in urban and suburban areas in order to find the fuel that they need uh, to make the rest of their flights. And we've actually learned that birds are actually attracted to urban areas because of our artificial light. Um, and so we see disproportionately more birds in urban areas than we would expect. And so when I started to see all these birds and I'm pointing them out to people, and I said, oh, this is so cool. You have a chestnut-sided warbler in your yard. And the homeowner was like, that's so cool. How are they doing? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. Because <laughs> nobody's ever studied that before. Um, but I'm very excited to show with you today that I got a bunch of money. <laughs> so I'm actually going to do that. And it was very exciting. Replacement. 
So this means that birds are producing enough young to replace the ones that have died. And so uh, you would expect that a stable population of chickadees will fluctuate around zero. Um, and if they, they have a positive number, they're increasing. If they have a negative number, they're declining. Okay? And so what we find when we plug in our data is that as non-native plant biomass increases, <coughs> population growth strongly declines. Um, in fact, um, it only overlaps replacement at 30% non-native plant biomass. So this is our upper confidence interval, which is a fancy you know, statistical term for the upper limit. So we can say with, with high certainty that if a neighborhood has less than 30% non-native plant biomass, there's at least some chance for you to produce, or for those chickadees to produce enough young to support a stable population. But once you get over 30%, uh, that likelihood is very, very low. And so we're offering 30% as a threshold that people can strive for if they're interested in creating bird habitat. You want to aim for 30% of the plant foliage in your yard, um, or I'm sorry, that more, more than 70% <laughs> oh, of, the, of the foliage in your yard to be native, and less than 30% of that to be non-native. And when I saw these results, I was actually pretty optimistic. And the reason for that is that in the Washington, D.C. area, our average non-native plant biomass is 55%. And so if you think about it, asking people to aim for 30% is really just kind of gentle nudge in that right direction towards starting to create better quality habitat for birds. And it also gives us a little bit of wiggle room so that we can maybe have those non-native plants that we have particular cultural value or aesthetic preferences, I really like Japanese maples. You know, it's non-invasive. If I work towards creating more native plant biomass in, in the yard, it may be okay to keep that one plant as well. But for our more sensitive insectivores, like our warblers and our flycatchers, I'll bet you that we probably have to aim a lot lower. And of course, in our um, Doug and I have done plant surveys in lots of different locations, and what we find is when we go into commercial areas or in our new developments, especially agricultural areas that are being um, transformed into residential neighborhoods, we see that these areas can have 80 to 90% non-native plant biomass. And so if we want to create bird habitat in these settings, that's going to require a much more drastic change in our landscaping preferences. So that's all I'm going to talk to you about non-native plants, but I've, I've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> and if you want to ask any more questions, please feel free um, at the end of this talk. Um, but now I want to switch to you to the second action item that I want to talk to you about today, which is really to embrace a lazy gardener approach. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that through a project that I'm working on now as a postdoc um, at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I, we, if you go into the United States right now, most of the yards that are out there have this tidy lawn aesthetic, which, as you can imagine, is a homogenized lawn, very nice and pristine, not very many trees and shrubs. Um, this is a lot of work to make a lawn like that, but this is the predominant um, landscaping type. Um, and as you might expect, it probably doesn't support that much biodiversity as well. But there has, is increasing interest of people to adopt a more nature-based or conservation approach to landscaping, such as having a wildlife-friendly yard, making a pollinator garden, or um, making a rain garden. That can also be a lot of work, but sometimes it's not that much work. Another thing that you could do is just take a step back and just let your yard go wild. Um, but while we, while people, while there's a lot of um, uh, push to make these wildlife friendly yards, there's not a lot of people that are actually testing in a data driven way to understand are these yards actually doing the benefits that we think that they're doing. And so that's really what we are working on here. Um, I'm working with Susanna Lerman, who's at the U.S. Uh, Forest Service. And we're working in six different cities around the United States 
Uh, Los Angeles, California, Phoenix, Arizona, Minneapolis, um, Minnesota, Baltimore, Maryland, Miami, Florida, and Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and we really are trying to understand how are these different landscaping aesthetics um, supporting biodiversity. And what we're doing in each one of these six cities is finding six different land use types. We're collecting data in different kinds of parks, both inside and outside of the city. But most importantly for this talk, talk we are collecting data in four different yard types. Two that are dominated by lawn, either with high resource inputs like fertilizers and pesticides, uh, where someone is putting a lot of effort into making that turf lawn perfect. We also have a low input lawn, which is Lawn doesn't necessarily dominate the yard. They're not really putting that much effort. They're sort of letting things go a little bit crazy. We also have two conservation-oriented approaches. Wildlife-friendly yards, which are certified by the National Wildlife Federation. And we also have water conservation yards. So for the purposes of Boston, Massachusetts, that would be putting in a rain garden. Um, so in each one of these yards, in each one of these cities, we are collecting biodiversity data. And to collect insect data, we use really fancy, super high-tech methods. We put out little plastic bowls, <laughs> we put dish soap in them, and then we sit back and wait. <laughs> and then we collect a bunch of bees and beetles, and then we can take them back into the lab, we can identify them, we can pin them, and then we can see how many species could we collect in these different yards, um, what kinds of species are they, and what sort of traits do they have, and then of course how many individuals are we collecting in these different yards. And so here's just some data that we have for Boston, Massachusetts. So we actually see that um, compared to our parks, we're getting more diversity on each one of those visits um, of bee diversity. Um, and so here's yards in blue on the left and parks on green on the right, which is great. This actually corresponds with um, what is the current narrative of bee conservation is that yards are really great for bees. We plant a lot of flowers, bees like them, they come in, and there's tremendous diversity. But it turns out that when you look at the identities of the bees, we are losing a lot of the specialists in these yards. And so remember I told you before that bees can be pollen specialists? Well, here we're seeing this effect of even though there's lots of high diversity in yards, we see decreases in pollen specialists, we see decreases in stem nesters, and we see increases in our most habitat generalist species, like our honeybee and our, and our common eastern bumblebee. But when we look at these different yard types separately, we see that there is some differences in the number of species that are supported. It's not drastically different, but it's at least a little bit of evidence that both the wildlife-friendly yards here in the blue and our low-maintenance yards in the yellow tend to support more bee diversity compared to our lawns with high maintenance and our rain gardens. And this is just data for Boston, Massachusetts, but we're looking at this across the United States so that we can understand, are there generalizable solutions that we can offer for people? And we're seeing the same um, relationships in, lot, in all kinds of different cities. <clears throat> and the reason for this, I believe, is what's going on is that in these wildlife-friendly yards and these low-maintenance yards, we're seeing more plant diversity, more potential nesting locations for these bees. A lot of them are nesting in dead stems that are left behind um, or in bare ground that's, um, that uh, is, is in areas of the lawn that are left to go and, and turf grass hasn't covered it. So we're seeing more heterogeneity or more differences in these different kinds of habitat types in these yards and that's contributing um, to bee diversity. So this is a little bit of evidence here that if you want to support the bees that really need help, you just got to let go. <laughs> just <laughs> let those dead stems hang out. Let some bare ground uh, uh, be in the corner of your 
yard. Um, my colleague, um, Susanna Lerman, who's at the Forest Service, she also had a really cool study that I wanted to share with you tonight. Um, she looked at bee diversity in Springfield, Massachusetts yards. And she only collected bees in only 16 yards um, in and around the city. And just during one season of sampling, she collected over 111 different species of bees. Just incredible diversity. Over 5,000 different individuals were collected and over 35 different species per yard were collected during the course of this study. And one of the really interesting things that she learned is that one of the most abundant species that was in her sampling is this lazy blossom bee here. It's lazy blossom Illinoisiae. We previously thought that this bee was an uncommon, rare, sensitive species of Massachusetts. And it turns out that it's doing really well in yards. We just weren't sampling there. And so we completely dramatically increased the number of records of this bee from Massachusetts just by paying attention to a habitat that was previously ignored. And so the purposes of this study, the reason why she was collecting these bees in the first place was to see, does your mowing matter when you're, um, does that matter for the floral resources for these bees? And she did find that, yes, that is the case, that if you decrease your mowing frequency to once every two weeks, you can increase both the abundance of bees and the diversity of bees that are found in your yard. And so two weeks is that, is that sweet spot. Um, where you're getting lots of uh, violets and clovers and strawberries and other sort of flowering plants um, that are coming up in the lawn that are providing lots of important foraging substrates uh, for or foraging opportunities for our urban bees. Um, and so this is, she's the one that really inspired me to, uh, to adopt this lazy lawnmower approach. Like I needed another reason not to mow my lawn. <laughs> and if you are if you are willing to uh, to join our crusade in, in reducing our lawn mowing, I uh, encourage you to go to the Forest Service website and you can download this sign so you can stick it on your lawn and sh and tell your owner or your neighbors um, this is why I stopped. I I'm mowing my lawn less frequently. I'm creating high quality pollinator habitat through by not doing anything. <laughs> the other thing that I want you to do is to think about keeping your leaf litter. How many people break up all your leaf litter, and, like stick it in a bed, a trash bag, and put it on the curb? Each time you're doing that, you're breaking up tons of nitrogen, which is really important for soil quality, but you're also breaking up homes and habitat for a lot of our insects that are spending the winter in the leaf litter. In fact, many, many of our moth and butterflies spend the winter as cocoons, like our luna moth. They become a cocoon in the leaf litter, they wrap themselves up in a dead leaf and they have to spend the entire winter before they can come out in the spring. And so if we want to create sustainable habitats for these butterflies and moths, we really need to keep that leaf litter there so that we can have a cycling population of these different species. But another reason to keep your leaf litter is that this is really important foraging substrates for birds because guess what they're eating in that leaf litter? Insects. In fact, I'm really interested in bird diets and for, for a lot of different species, like cat, um, uh, Carolina wrens, tufted titmice, um, uh, black cat chickadees, cardinals, when we look at their diets to see what proportion of their diet is seed versus fruit versus insects, their diets are still 40 to 50% insects in the winter time. And uh, who here knows what a kinglet is? I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of a kinglet. Kinglets, their diet is 90% insects in the winter, and they spend their winter right here. And so we really, you know, need to think about not just putting out bird feeders for, for birds in the winter time, but to really create these, this habitat that they can use to forage all year. 
one of the things that uh, people like to do is put up insect hotels. And I'm going to tell you that that might be too much work. You might want to think about not doing that. And the reason for that is that we're getting more evidence. Some of my colleagues are finding that these insect hotels aren't necessarily supporting native species. They're actually supporting a lot of the non-native species that are directly competing with our native bees and moths. And the other thing that these insect hotels are doing is if they're not maintained properly, if you just put them out and you forget about it, it can be harbors for pests and disease. And if they're designed poorly, they can really be a source for these problems for the local insect population. I don't study insect hotels. I'm not, you know, I, I wanted to know this myself. And I found this website. It's uh, colinperrington.com. And he has some really great information about what is a good design for an insect hotel and how you can do regular maintenance on it. So I encourage you. Um, to visit his website if you want to get more info. <clears throat> and so, um, basically, what our research is sort of pointing to so far is that that tidy lawn aesthetic is just too much work. You just want to throw that out the window. You want to adopt a nature-based or a conservation-oriented approach, but you can also do that in a lazy way. And so my suggestions for you is to embrace your lazy gardener by doing low mow, low lawn, low maintenance, and low or no pesticides. If you're going to use pesticides, use really directed, um, uh, con you know, concentrated pesticides towards particular things and not any kind of blanket pesticides. If you um, if you exhibit these four different behaviors in your yard, you will dramatically increase your biodiversity. Okay, so the last little bit I'm going to talk about here, feel free to cut me off if you need to, is to think about being wildlife friendly beyond your yard. So your yard is just a small little parcel that contributes to the broader landscape. And I want to provide you a little bit of evidence for how you are contributing to the broader landscape. And here, if you had your yard in this little neighborhood right here, your yard is also affecting your neighbors, and your neighbors are affecting you. Your activities in your yard are also affecting your local parks and the connectivity of habitat from one park to another. And the final thing is that your yard and the behaviors that you make in your everyday life can affect um, your town and the ability of your town to support pollinator habitat as well. And so I'm going to share with you just this last little bit of some of my research. One piece of action item for you also is to try to think about reducing artificial light. And that can be just as simple as before you go to bed at night, turning off your light. We know that lights can be problems for birds, but they can also be problems for insects. This is a paper that Doug and I have um, that we're working on right now where we're actually collecting moths in different forests in Delaware and identifying the species and the abundance and biomass of moths. Down here on the x-axis, we have moth-friendly plants. That's a really simple way of saying the plants that support the most diversity. So I'm telling you to plant all these great native plants. Well, guess what? <laughs> in our forest fragments, you get a strong increase in moths when you plant these plants, great. But primarily when light is low and the effects, the positive benefits of that, of those plants in your yard decreases as light gets higher and higher. It could be that these lights are, are contributing to mortality of these moths. It could be that the lights are just attracting the moths out of the forest fragment. But either way, this is a little bit of preliminary evidence to show that the lights that are happening in the neighborhood are having a negative effect on the biodiversity that are left behind in these forest fragments. The other action item that I want you to think about is telling your neighbor about everything that you learned tonight and everything that you're doing in your yard to create pollinator habitat. You can do that by putting up a sign like our, um, our pollinator habitat or just telling them about all the exciting things that you're doing. And I can provide you a little bit of evidence that that will make a difference. If you're able to convince the people around you to also have a wildlife friendly yard, the benefits 
of wildlife friendliness skyrocket. We have an exponential, this is beetle diversity, we have an exponential increase in the benefits of having a wildlife friendly yard when the neighbors are increasing the amount of tree canopy. If the neighbors have low tree canopy, you get some benefits, but it's really not making the biggest benefits that you can possibly get. So this is a little bit of evidence of that additive effect of, of all the parcels in a neighborhood really contributing to biodiversity. Unfortunately, one yard can only do one thing, or it can only do a small little bit. Even with our chickadees, we saw that it really took a neighborhood to raise one clutch of chickadees. So we really have to work on scaling up. And you'll see here, wildlife friendly yards are getting a really big benefit. Parks are getting a benefit. Guess what yard isn't getting a benefit? <laughs> the ones that people are putting a lot of effort in to create that lawn. Okay, and so the last little bit that I want to talk to you about is your action item is to get involved. And you're already starting to do that by being here tonight and learning about different things that we do. But I would be lying to you if I told you that the only thing that's negatively affecting bees and butterflies and other biodiversity is the stuff that we're doing in our yards. We have other issues like climate change, land use change, pesticides and agriculture. All these different things are contributing to part of our biodiversity decline. And so what we really need is for the people to speak out. So it's not just scientists saying that we need to make these changes. For example, one, people ask me all the time, how can we get Home Depot to, to sell native plants? And the answer is, I need you guys to tell them that you want to buy it. Because if we make some effort as consumers to, to put our money where our mouth is and buy the plants that are supporting biodiversity, the businesses will respond, I hope. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we need to demand change at both local and at federal scales if we want to really support biodiversity. Also, our yards are only one piece. We need to also remember that Having protected parks are also important, but they require funding, support, and political support from the local community. In terms of, um, in terms of bees especially, we see a lot of evidence that climate change is having a negative effect on bee populations. And so the sustainable practices that you make in your everyday by not having uh, disposable um, bags or um, turning your lights off or putting up solar panels. These things are also helping pollinators. And so this is really important to keep these uh, behaviors in mind too. And then the other thing that I want to leave you with is to think, I hope that you'll think now more about conservation opportunities in your day to day. So you can have great habitat for pollinators and birds in your yard, but think about other places where we could do these sort of things too, like your local library, or a school, or on a road verge, or in a vacant lot that's been teared down, torn down. Think about where we can find some additional opportunities to create habitat, because having all these different patches will have the additive effect at a landscape scale. The last thing that I want to leave you with here is, I just learned about this, I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't know this, is that the UN has dedicated this decade to ecosystem restoration. That is the goal of our United Nations. And I just think that's incredibly powerful and awesome that they are recognizing the importance of creating landscapes that support people and support ecological service and biodiversity. And so my challenge to you today is to take your yard as one piece in this global effort to have um, ecosystem restoration, to really make changes for the next generations in the upcoming decades. I hope what I've shared with you today really gives you some evidence that your gardens really matter. And that those simple choices that you're making your landscaping are not just small choices, they're having really important implications for biodiversity. And so what I want you to do also when you leave here today is to think about how you can explore your gardens and learn about all this amazing biodiversity that's using there. 
using, using your properties. I have no doubt that me playing in my backyard as a kid is part of what inspired me to care about the world today. And so I try to instill that same curiosity and enthusiasm about the natural world in my son now, and I hope that I have uh, passed that on to you today. And if you're interested in learning more about the different species in your yards, check out this website. Because when you start learning about the names of what you actually have, I feel, I, I have no doubt that you will be more inspired to care about them as well. And this website is a great opportunity where you can take pictures of bugs and birds and plants and, and it will help you identify them um, to figure out what you actually have. Uh, so with that, I just want to say thank you to all the landowners and the architects and the volunteers that participated in this project. Um, without their help in these funding sources, none of this would be possible. And um, if you want any more information about this research, you can find all my papers uh, on my website here. And um, you can also feel free to send me emails if you have questions. You can also find me on Twitter, hashtag Plants for Wildlife. And I just want to thank you for your time, and I'll take your questions. Native, 
Um, but for the purposes of this study, this is what I need. Um, we, I'm also going to talk a lot about native plant biomass, and so I want to give you a sense for how we actually calculated that. Um, and so what we did is do very careful surveys where we measured the crown volume, the height of the crown, and the width and the depth. And we can use um, some equations to calculate what the volume of foliage is, and then use some very careful forestry um, calculations to determine whether um, what is the dominance of native plants and the dominance of non-native plants. Um, that's a very uh, crude overlook of how we did that, but I can speak to you in more detail later if you're interested. And what we found is that um, when we look at the amount of caterpillar biomass on native and uh, non-native trees, we see much higher found on native trees compared to our non-natives. Um, and so this is really showing that the differences in diversity that entomologists have found um, when they found fewer species and fewer specialists, this is actually translating into um, a metric that's meaningful for birds, which is the amount of food that is out there. I actually have done um, some more analyses on these data and I actually see that most of the insects are more abundant on native trees. The ones that aren't more abundant, um, or the ones that are more abundant on non-native trees are things like scale insects, aphids, leaf hoppers, a lot of those horticultural pests, which also tend to be non-native, and they were imported in with the host plant when, when that plant was originally introduced. Doug and I did a side study um, also to look at cultivars. So if you go to a plant nursery, you're not going to find a red maple that's similar genetically to the red maple that's found in the forest. <coughs> you're going to find one that's been bred specifically for horticulture. And so what we wanted to do was to see, are these native cultivars supporting insects in the same way as our straight native species? And so we looked at six different traits that are selected for in horticulture. We looked at enhanced fall color, so it's more red in the fall. Leaf variegation, like the sweet gum. Uh, change of growth habit. Um, so if it's a dwarf versus a tall tree, uh, enhanced fruiting, like blueberries, um, and also red or purple leaves. And so we compared, um, so for example, uh, for this variegated sweet gum, we compared the straight sweet gum to a variegated version. And what we found is that the only trait that had any negative effect on caterpillar abundance and diversity were red leaf cultivars. So here this is an example of an eastern redbud that has been bred to have lots of red coloring. And it makes sense that these trees wouldn't support the same caterpillar diversity because they um, have these anthocyanins that are in the leaves that deter feeding. But for all the other traits, we didn't see any clear relationships, which suggests some evidence that buying those cultivars at a plant nursery might be okay. But we really do need more research. Unfortunately, we have colleagues that are working on this question right now. <clears throat> the next question was really understand, uh, do chickadees prefer native plants? If these native plants have more food, are they actually finding, um, are they actually preferring them? And we basically let the chickadees tell us what they like. So we use this technique called color banding. So we put these, we actually capture the birds, we put plastic color bands on their legs, and then we can identify this bird with our binoculars and know exactly who that individual is. So this is blue-yellow, he's my favorite. I knew, I knew that he was paired to a, to a female that had pink. I knew that he was having young and he had six babies, and then I could follow him around the neighborhood and see just what kind of plants that he's choosing. And so here's Blue Yellow's territory. At the star here is where the nest is. And you can see a lot of the foraging was happening right there around the nest in that focal yard. And part of that was because the person had planted a black cherry right in their tree. So, oh, do you have a question? What's the neighborhood? Where is oh, it? Oh, I'm sorry, this is in Washington, D.C. Oh, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. Yes, yeah, so most of this work is happening in downtown Washington, D.C and in the suburban areas of Maryland around as well. 
Um, and so this homeowner had planted black cherry, which the, the birds were really liking. So they went there a lot. They went to a sweet gum that was planted as a street tree. They uh, went to an airwood viburnum in the neighbor's yard, a Princeton elm, which is a cultivar of elm that's resistant to Dutch elm disease that was found along the street. And they also went over this neighbor who let their yard go if a black walnut came up. <laughs> so you can see that there's a lot of areas of this neighborhood that these birds are really using selective foraging, but there's a lot of areas in this neighborhood that they're avoiding. Uh, so what is it that these birds are avoiding? And the answer is, it's non-native plants. <laughs> and we went back to see just how many species of caterpillar these different plants were supporting, and we found this really nice positive relationship between the number of caterpillar species that a plant supports and how much the birds liked that plant as well. So here for native plants, you see the strong linear relationship which is the kind of relationship that scientists just kind of dream about. <laughs> um, so they highly prefer our, um, uh, our trees that are supporting the most caterpillars. We see that preferences are lower for non-native plants, um, and that relationship is also much weaker, suggesting that these plants are not reliable for finding food and are really just kind of functioning as pretty things in the landscape and not um, supporting habitat. Um, you may be wondering right now, well, what sort of non-native plants is supporting over 500 different species of caterpillar? And the answer to that is congeneric species. So things like native maples are, or red maples are our native uh, maple, and then we have Norway maple, which is a non-native version that's very closely related to red maple, but it's from, it's introduced to our region. So here, most of our non-native, um, unrelated plant taxa are almost completely avoided. The, the birds just don't prefer them at all. We see that our related species, like Norway maple, Japanese cherry, those ones are preferred a little bit more, but they're not the ecological equivalent of the native species. So if you really want to support habitat for birds, you need to prioritize the straight native species. So while we were um, following these chickadees around, it was also spring migration. Uh, the chickadees in Washington, D.C. are breeding from, uh, from the first week of April to the first week of June. And so we're following these birds around to these oak trees, and at the same time, these trees are dripping with colorful warblers and tanagers and orioles and all kinds of amazing um, creatures. In fact, during the four years that I did this study, we documented over 50 different species of migratory birds and over 20 species of warbler that are using residential yards. And when I tell this to ornithologists, their mind is blown. They're always just so incredibly surprised that we would see this kind of diversity. But these are birds that don't breed in yards at all. They breed in the boreal forests of Canada and every year they make transcontinental flights of, um, ton of thousands of miles into Central and South America in order to track food resources. And so, but during the way, they're stopping over in urban and suburban areas in order to find the fuel that they need uh, to make the rest of their flights. And we've actually learned that birds are actually attracted to urban areas because of our artificial light. Um, and so we see disproportionately more birds in urban areas than we would expect. And so when I started to see all these birds and I'm pointing them out to people, and I said, oh, this is so cool. You have a chestnut-sided warbler in your yard. And the homeowner was like, that's so cool. How are they doing? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> that before. Um, but I'm very excited to show with you today that I got a bunch of money. <laughs> so I'm actually going to do that. And it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, can, I can assure you that this was inspired by those con conversations that I had with people because I wanted to know, they were so excited to see these birds, but they wanted to know what they could do to support them. And so we're going to be working with the Forest Service here um, to start a new project starting this fall in Springfield, Massachusetts, to 
understand how different urban green spaces are supporting migratory birds. So, if you want to get more information about what native what plants are native to your area, and also to get those numbers that I talked about about the number of caterpillar species that different plants support, you can get that information right now by going to the National Wildlife Federation's website. They have a native plant finder. Um, and that has all of the numbers that I've presented to you today, where you can look up a plant to see how many caterpillar species it supports, or you can also look up a butterfly to see what kind of plant you might need in order um, to support it. So, the next part of this talk is really, if we know that birds are accurately assessing habitat quality, um, are there consequences if non-native plants are abundant? And um, to answer this question, we have to collect a lot of different data. So we have to collect data about reproduction. So we have to monitor nests and see how many eggs they lay. We need to collect data about adult survival. So we actually use those color-banded birds to see if they're surviving year to year. And we have to collect data about juvenile survival. And we can put that all into a population model so that we can understand how well these birds are doing and whether they're producing enough young to replace the adults that die over the year. And what we find is that as non-native plant biomass increases, so this is the amount of foliage that's considered non-native, we see a strong decline in the number of young that are fledged per territory. What we found is actually different effects on number of eggs, on number of young, on whether the nest survives, and a lot of those effects were fairly modest. It's just when you compound all of those effects over the course of the breeding season, we see this huge decline in the number of young that are fledged. And we see that the birds are avoiding areas with non-native plants, but if they are using them, they're actually producing fewer young as well. <clears throat> so, we can take all of that data, we can plug that into a population growth equation, and this graph is a little confusing, so I'm just going to like get you oriented for a second. So here at zero, this dashed line is replacement. So this means that birds are producing enough young to replace the ones that have died. And so uh, you would expect that a stable population of chickadees will fluctuate around zero. Um, and if they, they have a positive number, they're increasing. If they have a negative number, they're declining. Okay, And so what we find when we plug in our data is that as non-native plant biomass increases, <clears throat> population growth strongly declines. Um, in fact, um, it only overlaps replacement at 30% non-native plant biomass. So this is our upper confidence interval, which is a fancy you know, statistical term for the upper limit. So we can say with, with high certainty that if a neighborhood has less than 30% non-native plant biomass, there's at least some chance for you to produce, or for those chickadees to produce enough young to support a stable population. But once you get over 30%, uh, that likelihood is very, very low. And so we're offering 30% as a threshold that people can strive for if they're interested in creating bird habitat. You want to aim for 30% of the plant foliage in your yard um, or, I'm sorry, that more, more than 70% yeah. oh, of, the, of the foliage in your yard to be native, and less than 30% of that to be non-native. And when I saw these results, I was actually pretty optimistic. And the reason for that is that in the Washington, D.C. area, our average non-native plant biomass is 55%. And so if you think about it, asking people to aim for 30% is really just kind of gentle nudge in that right direction towards starting to create better quality habitat for birds. And it also gives us a little bit of wiggle room so that we can maybe have those non-native plants that we have particular cultural value or aesthetic preferences. I really like Japanese maples. You know, it's not invasive If I work towards creating more native plant biomass in, in the yard, it may be okay to keep that one plant as well. But for our more sensitive insectivores, like our warblers and our flycatchers, I'll bet you that we probably have to aim a lot lower. And of course,
course, in our, um, Doug and I have done plant surveys in lots of different locations, and what we find is when we go into commercial areas or in our new developments, especially agricultural areas that are being um, transformed into residential neighborhoods, we see that these areas can have 80 to 90% non-native plant biomass. And so if we want to create bird habitat in these settings, that's going to require a much more drastic change in our landscaping preferences. So that's all I'm going to talk to you about non-native plants, but I've, I've done a lot of stuff. And if you want to ask any more questions, please feel free um, at the end of this talk. Um, but now I want to switch to you to the second action item that I want to talk to you about today, which is really to embrace a lazy gardener approach. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that through a project that I'm working on now as a postdoc um, at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I, we, if you go into the United States right now, most of the yards that are out there have this tidy lawn aesthetic, which, as you can imagine, is a homogenized lawn, very nice and pristine, not very many trees and shrubs. Um, this is a lot of work to make a lawn like that, but this is the predominant um, landscaping type. Um, and as you might expect, it probably doesn't support that much biodiversity as well. But there has, is increasing interest of people to adopt a more nature-based or conservation approach to landscaping, such as having a wildlife-friendly yard, making a pollinator garden, or um, making a rain garden. That can also be a lot of work, but sometimes it's not that much work. Another thing that you could do is just take a step back and just let your yard go wild. Um, but while we, while people, while there's a lot of um, uh, push to make these wildlife friendly yards, there's not a lot of people that are actually testing in a data driven way to understand are these yards actually doing the benefits that we think that they're doing. And so that's really what we are working on here. Um, I'm working with Susanna Lerman, who's at the US uh, Forest Service, and we're working in six different cities around the United States. Uh, Los Angeles, California, Phoenix, Arizona, Minneapolis, um, Minnesota, Baltimore, Maryland, Miami, Florida, and Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and we really are trying to understand how are these different landscaping aesthetics um, supporting biodiversity. And what we're doing in each one of these six cities is finding six different land use types. We're collecting data in different kinds of parks, both inside and outside of the city. But most importantly for this talk, talk we are collecting data in four different yard types. Two that are dominated by lawn, either with high resource inputs like fertilizers and pesticides, uh, where someone is putting a lot of effort into making that turf lawn perfect. We also have a low input lawn, which is lawn doesn't necessarily dominate the yard. They're not really putting that much effort. They're sort of letting things go a little bit crazy. We also have two conservation oriented approaches. Wildlife friendly yards, which are certified by the National Wildlife Federation. And we also have water conservation yards. So for the purposes of Boston, Massachusetts, that would be putting in a rain garden. Um, so in each one of these yards, in each one of these cities, we are collecting biodiversity data. And to collect insect data, we use really fancy, super high-tech methods. We put out little plastic bowls, <laughs> we put dish soap in them, and then we sit back and wait. <laughs> And then we collect a bunch of bees and beetles, and then we can take them back into the lab, we can identify them, we can pin them, and then we can see how many species did we collect in these different yards, um, what kinds of species are they, and what sort of traits do they have, and then of course how many individuals are we collecting in these different yards. And so here's just some data that we have for Boston, Massachusetts. So we actually see that um, compared to our parks, we're getting more diversity on each one of those visits um, of bee diversity. Um, and so here's yards in blue on the left and parks on green on the right, which is great. This actually 
corresponds with um, what is the current narrative of bee conservation is that yards are really great for bees. We plant a lot of flowers, bees like them, they come in, and there's tremendous diversity. But it turns out that when you look at the identities of the bees, we are losing a lot of the specialists in these yards. And so remember I told you before that bees can be pollen specialists? Well, here we're seeing this effect of even though there's lots of high diversity in yards, we see decreases in pollen specialists, we see decreases in stem nesters, and we see increases in our most habitat generalist species, like our honeybee and our, and our common eastern bumblebee. But when we look at these different yard types separately, we see that there is some differences in the number of species that are supported. It's not drastically different, but it's at least a little bit of evidence that both the wildlife-friendly yards here in the blue and our low-maintenance yards in the yellow tend to support more bee diversity compared to our lawns with high maintenance and our rain gardens. And this is just data for Boston, Massachusetts, but we're looking at this across the United States so that we can understand, are there generalizable solutions that we can offer for people? And we're seeing the same um, relationships in, lot, in all kinds of different cities. <clears throat> and the reason for this, I believe, is what's going on is that in these wildlife-friendly yards and these low-maintenance yards, we're seeing more plant diversity, more potential nesting locations for these bees. A lot of them are nesting in dead stems that are left behind um, or in bare ground that's, um, that uh, is, is in areas of the lawn that are left to go and, and turf grass hasn't covered it. So we're seeing more heterogeneity or more differences in these different kinds of habitat types in these yards and that's contributing um, to bee diversity. So this is a little bit of evidence here that if you want to support the bees that really need help, you just gotta let go. <laughs> just <laughs> let those dead stems hang out. Let some bare ground uh, uh, be in the corner of your yard. Um, my colleague, um, Susanna Lerman, who's at the Forest Service, she also had a really cool study that I wanted to share with you tonight. Um, she looked at bee diversity in Springfield, Massachusetts yards. And she only collected bees in only 16 yards um, in and around the city. And just during one season of sampling, she collected over 111 different species of bees. Just incredible diversity. Over 5,000 different individuals were collected and over 35 different species per yard were collected during the course of this study. And one of the really interesting things that she learned is that one of the most abundant species that was in her sampling is this Lazioblossom bee here. It's Lazioblossom illinoisiae. We previously thought that this bee was an uncommon rare, sensitive species of Massachusetts. And it turns out that it's doing really well in yards. We just weren't sampling there. And so we completely dramatically increased the number of records of this bee from Massachusetts just by paying attention to a habitat that was previously ignored. And so the purposes of this study, the reason why she was collecting these bees in the first place was to see, does your mowing matter when you're, um, does that matter for the floral resources for these bees? And she did find that, yes, that is the case, that if you decrease your mowing frequency to once every two weeks, you can increase both the abundance of bees and the diversity of bees that are found in your yard. And so two weeks is that, is that sweet spot. Um, where you're getting lots of uh, violets and clovers and strawberries and other sort of flowering plants um, that are coming up in the lawn that are providing lots of important foraging substrates uh, for or foraging opportunities for our urban bees. Um, and so this is, she's the one that really inspired me 
to, uh, to adopt this lazy lawnmower approach. Like I needed another reason not to mow my lawn. <laughs> and if you were if you were willing to uh, to join our crusade in, in reducing our lawn mowing, I uh, encourage you to go to the Forest Service website and you can download this sign so you can stick it on your lawn and sh and tell your owner or your neighbors. Um, this is why I stopped. I I'm mowing my lawn less frequently. I'm creating high quality pollinator habitat through by not doing anything. <laughs> the other thing that I want you to do is to think about keeping your leaf litter. How many people break up all your leaf litter and like stick it in a bag, a trash bag, and put it on the curb? Each time you're doing that, you're breaking up tons of nitrogen, which is really important for soil quality, but you're also breaking up homes and habitat for a lot of our insects that are spending the winter in the leaf litter. In fact, many, many of our moth and butterflies spend the winter as cocoons, like our luna moth. They become a cocoon in the leaf litter, they wrap themselves up in a dead leaf, and they have to spend the entire winter before they can come out in the spring. And so if we want to create sustainable habitats for these butterflies and moths, we really need to keep that leaf litter there so that we can have a cycling population of these different species. But another reason to keep your leaf litter is that this is really important foraging substrates for birds. Because guess what they're eating in that leaf litter? Insects. In fact, I'm really interested in bird diets. And for, for a lot of different species, like cat, um, uh, Carolina wrens, tufted titmice, um, uh, black cat chickadees, cardinals, when we look at their diets to see what proportion of their diet is seed versus fruit versus insects, their diets are still 40 to 50% insects in the winter time. And uh, who here knows what a kinglet is? I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of a kinglet. Kinglets, their diet is 90% insects in the winter, and they spend their winter right here. And so we really, you know, need to think about not just putting out bird feeders for, for birds in the winter time, but to really create these, this habitat that they can use to forage all year. One of the things that uh, people like to do is put up insect hotels. And I'm going to tell you that that might be too much work. You might want to think about not doing that. And the reason for that is that we're getting more evidence. Some of my colleagues are finding that these insect hotels aren't necessarily supporting native species. They're actually supporting a lot of the non-native species that are directly competing with our native bees and moths. And the other thing that these insect hotels are doing is if they're not maintained properly, if you just put them out and you forget about it, it can be harbors for pests and disease. And if they're designed poorly, they can really be a source for these problems for the local insect population. I don't study insect hotels. I'm not, you know, I, I wanted to know this myself. And I found this website. It's uh, colinporrington.com. And he has some really great information about what is a good design for an insect hotel and how you can do regular maintenance on it. So I encourage you um, to visit his website if you want to get more info. And so um, basically, what our research is sort of pointing to so far is that that tidy lawn aesthetic is just too much work. You just want to throw that out the window. You want to adopt a nature-based or a conservation-oriented approach, but you can also do that in a lazy way. And so my suggestions for you is to embrace your lazy gardener by doing low mow, low lawn, low maintenance, and low or no pesticides. If you're going to use pesticides, use really directed, um, uh, con you know, concentrated pesticides towards particular things and not any kind of blanket pesticides. If you, um, if you exhibit these four different behaviors in your yard, you will dramatically increase your biodiversity. Okay, so the last little bit I'm going to talk about here, feel free to cut me off if you need to, is to think about being wildlife friendly beyond your yard. So your yard is just a small little parcel that contributes to the broader landscape. 
And I want to provide you a little bit of evidence for how you are contributing to the broader landscape. And here, if you had your yard in this little neighborhood right here, your yard is also affecting your neighbors, and your neighbors are affecting you. Your activities in your yard are also affecting your local parks and the connectivity of habitat from one park to another. And the final thing is that your yard and the behaviors that you make in your everyday life can affect um, your town and the ability of your town to support pollinator habitat as well. And so I'm going to share with you just this last little bit of some of my research. One piece of action item for you also is to try to think about reducing artificial light. And that can be just as simple as before you go to bed at night, turning off your light. We know that lights can be problems for birds, but they can also be problems for insects. This is a paper that Doug and I have um, that we're working on right now where we're actually collecting moths in different forests in Delaware and identifying the species and the abundance and biomass of moths. Down here on the x-axis, we have moth-friendly plants. That's a really simple way of saying the plants that support the most diversity. So I'm telling you to plant all these great native plants. Well, guess what? <laughs> in our forest fragments, you get a strong increase in moths when you plant these plants. Great. But primarily when light is low and the effects, the positive benefits of that, of those plants in your yard decreases as light gets higher and higher. It could be that these lights are, are contributing to mortality of these moths. It could be that the lights are just attracting the moths out of the forest fragment. But either way, this is a little bit of preliminary evidence to show that the lights that are happening in the neighborhood are having a negative effect on the biodiversity that are left behind in these forest fragments. The other action item that I want you to think about is telling your neighbor about everything that you learned tonight and everything that you're doing in your yard to create pollinator habitat. You can do that by putting up a sign like our, um, our pollinator habitat or just telling them about all the exciting things that you're doing. And I can provide you a little bit of evidence that that will make a difference. If you're able to convince the people around you to also have a wildlife friendly yard, the benefits of wildlife friendliness skyrocket. We have an exponential, this is beetle diversity, we have an exponential increase in the benefits of having a wildlife on the yard when the neighbors are increasing the amount of tree canopy. If the neighbors have low tree canopy, you get some benefits, but it's really not making the biggest benefits that you can possibly get. So this is a little bit of evidence of that additive effect of, of all the parcels in a neighborhood really contributing to biodiversity. Unfortunately, one yard can only do one thing, or it can only do a small little bit. Even with our chickadees, we saw they re it really took a neighborhood to raise one clutch of chickadees. So we really have to work on scaling up. And you'll see here, wildlife friendly yards are getting a really big benefit. Parks are getting a benefit. Guess what yard isn't getting a benefit? <laughs> the ones that people were putting a lot of effort in to create that lawn. Okay, and so the last little bit that I want to talk to you about is your action item is to get involved. And you're already starting to do that by being here tonight and learning about different things that we do. But I would be lying to you if I told you that the only thing that's negatively affecting bees and butterflies and other biodiversity is the stuff that we're doing in our yards. We have other issues like climate change, land use change, pesticides and agriculture, all these different things are contributing to part of our biodiversity decline. And so what we really need is for the people to speak out. So it's not just scientists saying that we need to make these changes. For example, one, people ask me all the time, how can we get Home Depot to, to sell native plants? And the answer is, I need you guys to tell them that you want to buy it. Because if we make some effort as consumers to, to put our money where our mouth is and buy the plants that are supporting biodiversity, the businesses will respond, I hope. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we need to demand change
change at both local and at federal scales, and we want to really support biodiversity. Also, our yards are only one piece. We need to also remember that having protected parks are also important, but they require funding, support, and political support from the local community. In terms of um, in terms of bees especially, we see a lot of evidence that climate change is having a negative effect on bee populations. And so the sustainable practices that you make in your everyday by not having uh, disposable um, bags or um, turning your lights off or putting up solar panels, these things are also helping pollinators. And so this is really important to keep these uh, behaviors in mind too. And then the other thing that I want to leave you with is to think, I hope that you'll think now more about conservation opportunities in your day to day. So you can have great habitat for pollinators and birds in your yard, but think about other places where we could do these sort of things too, like your local library, or a school, or on a road verge, or in a vacant lot that's been teared down, torn down. Think about where we can find some additional opportunities to create habitat. Because having all these different patches will have the additive effect at a landscape scale. The last thing that I want to leave you with here is, I just learned about this, I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't know this, is that the UN has dedicated this decade to ecosystem restoration. That is the goal of our United Nations. And I just think that's incredibly powerful and awesome that they are recognizing the importance of creating landscapes that support people and support ecological service and biodiversity. And so my challenge to you today is to take your yard as one piece in this global effort to have um, ecosystem restoration to really make changes for the next generations in the upcoming decades. I hope what I've shared with you today really gives you some evidence that your gardens really matter. And that those simple choices that you're making your landscaping are not just small choices, they're having really important implications for biodiversity. And so what I want you to do also when you leave here today is to think about how you can explore your gardens and learn about all this amazing biodiversity that's using there, using, using your properties. I have no doubt that me playing in my backyard as a kid is part of what inspired me to care about the world today. And so I try to instill that same curiosity and enthusiasm about the natural world in my son now, and I hope that I have uh, passed that on to you today. And if you're interested in learning more about the different species in your yards, check out this website. Because when you start learning about the names of what you actually have, I feel, I, I have no doubt that you will be more inspired to care about them as well. And this website is a great opportunity where you can take pictures of bugs and birds and plants and, and it will help you identify them um, to figure out what you actually have. Uh, so with that, I just want to say thank you to all the landowners and the architects and the volunteers that participated in this project. Um, without their help in these funding sources, none of this would be possible. And um, if you want any more information about this research, you can find all my papers uh, on my website here. And um, you can also feel free to send me emails if you have questions. You can also find me on Twitter, hashtag Plants for Wildlife. And I just want to thank you for your time, and I'll take your questions. <laughs>